Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Diachronic, your host here on Diachronic Radio. Now, this video is completely left field for me, but I thought I'd try something different, so let me know what you think. In today's episode, we discuss the treatment for COVID-19, the pandemic keeping us all inside. And when I say treatment, I mean we have an actual potential treatment for coronavirus right now. With me here today, I have a very special guest, my brother and molecular biologist at UCSF, Dr. Mehdi Bouhadou. What's up, bro? Hey, what's up, bro? Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Now, before we get into the crux of the topic, please give us an idea of what your job normally is and what your role is in curing this plague. So I'm a postdoc at UCSF. I'm a molecular biologist, so I do experiments with cells and dishes. I try to understand how we can better treat cancer. I study cancer cells, but now I study coronavirus because everybody in the lab is studying it. And we're trying to find drugs that people currently take that could be repurposed to treat coronavirus. All right. Wonderful. So to set the stage, my brother has been working 17 hours a day for many weeks now. And until last Sunday, March 22nd, where he threw up his hands in clenched fist in victory. And he immediately went down to our family group chat and he exclaimed, We're done! And that's with two exclamation points. Following that, he dropped some links to his research, which you can see on screen, this beautiful map that he made, and also news posts about their announcement. Followed again by more exclamation points. My brother here was very excited with what he had. Now, as I understand it, we are still several months to a year away from a vaccine. So what exactly did you find? Yeah, that's right. So we are several, probably a year out from an effective vaccine. So I think what we really need is the treatment that we can use now. And for that to work, we need to stick with what's called FDA approved treatments. So those are treatments that the doctor can already prescribe to patients. Uh, like patients who have diabetes, they, he prescribes metformin. You know, that's something that we know is safe for people to take. So if we can repurpose these drugs, if we figure out, oh, metformin actually also works to treat coronavirus, then these doctors can prescribe metformin off label to treat coronavirus. Now, I'm not saying metformin is what you should take to treat coronavirus. We have not tested that. We're trying to identify drugs that could could be repurposed to, to treat um, SARS-CoV-2. And so what you're saying is that you actually have identified certain things that you believe will work for coronavirus? Yeah, that's right. Viruses, they need a human host to be able to reproduce themselves. So basically the, the virus invades your cells and hijacks your cellular machinery in order to replicate itself. So what we've done in our lab is we've mapped which proteins, which of those cellular machines the virus needs to replicate itself. By identifying those molecular machines, we can then map those machines to drugs that we know target those cellular machines. And therefore we can sort of remove the things that the virus needs to replicate itself by using those drugs. So this is all in theory. We've created this map, but now we actually need to test this. So we're collaborating with people in New York and Paris who have the virus in their lab, and they can actually do these tests in a dish with human cells, and then we can move into animal models. And if that all goes well, then then maybe we can see this actually affecting people. And how, how long exactly do you expect this testing to take from what we have now to having something that is a, a treatment that a doctor could prescribe to their patient? Yeah, it's a good question. First, you start with cell culture experiments. That's just like a plastic dish with cells in it and you put the virus in and then you treat with the drug and then you see what happens to the virus. That takes you know, weeks, maybe a week or two to get some good results. Animal models can take a little bit longer. They cannot, they can take a few weeks, like two weeks, three weeks to really get solid results there. I would say like maybe like a month or a month and a half to get, you know, a pretty confident result. Everybody is working on this right now on our team. So it's not like we have a personnel problem. So that also helps to push things forward at a fast rate. So are you saying that my doctor down the street within two months or so will be able to have a prescribable medicine for a cure to the coronavirus. I mean, that's what we hope, right? We don't know that the things we predicted, we predicted 69 drugs that we think could be repurposed to treat it, but it could be that these drugs actually improve the virus's ability to infect our cells. Yeah, super corona, it's a corona extra. Right, we just know that we identified things that the virus interacts with in our cells. But we don't know if that interaction is positive or negative. So I really emphasize that we need to test this stuff. But if we do find something that's fairly effective with a drug that's already approved, we could see doctors prescribing this within two months. And with that treatment from doctors, how long can we expect a normal vaccine to come out of this? Yeah, I mean, so usually it takes about a year to develop a vaccine like this. We, we have a, a sort of working vaccine, but it needs to be tested in animals and humans. So we're actually starting clinical trials already for humans 
um, for mm-hmm. the for this vaccine, it'll probably be effective because the virus doesn't seem to mutate that quickly. Although we we're not super sure about that, because as you guys know, with the flu vaccine, you have to get a new one every year, and that's because the virus can mutate very quickly. So so we think it'll take about a year a year to get a really confident vaccine. But that's why we're focusing on drugs in my group because we think there we can have a quicker impact than waiting for a vaccine. I mean, both are really important. It's very important to develop a vaccine, especially if this comes back the next year. Then we want to be prepared. All right. Well- Wonderful. Now, I, I kind of switching gears back to what I was saying before, I personally have not been very affected by the quarantine. You know, my job's on the internet, I stay home a lot anyways, but a lot of people out there are really hurting, not being able to go to their jobs and make money, and a lot of them are definitely getting a bit of cabin fever. When do you think it might be safe to actually lift quarantine based on healthcare capacity and all that? Now, I realize it's not your specific purview of knowing how this all works, but you have a good understanding of how the virus affects people and how it infects people. Uh, When do you think that we can go outside? Is that after that two month period, once we get the treatment or is it gonna be longer than that? You know, it's impossible to know right? It's impossible to know exactly how long it's going to take for this epidemic to be over. It depends also on on how good people are at staying home now, because if everyone stayed home, like if everyone stayed home now for five weeks, then we could get past it in that short of a time. But if not, if people are still going out and still doing things and still interacting and still spreading the virus, then it could take longer. In my mind, I'm thinking it'll take probably, you know, a few months until until we're through this and, and maybe we'll be able to go back to work before that, before those months are over. But Um, Right now, it's sort of impossible to know. I would say at least a month, maybe two months. And as my final line of questioning, I would like to know what you think will happen in the future. Is there a critical failure in our healthcare system that can be changed to tackle a pandemic better? Well, I think this country was pretty unprepared for for a pandemic. I mean, I think I think there are experts in the field that have prepared resources and and have thought these things through, but I don't think it's really been deployed on a large scale. So I think that we as a country are going to change a lot after this pandemic and exactly how we organize the country to respond to a pandemic like this. Do we have, you know, emergency hospitals that we open up? Like, do we set up tents to test people in their cars? Do we shut down cities and and keep people home from work right as soon as we have the first case? You know, this kind of these kinds of initiatives, I think, are going to become more standard for future pandemics because um, this is sort of the first one that's really been the center of attention like this. I mean, flu is, a, is already a pandemic every year. And uh, finally, I would like to know what you think the ultimate virus is. This is absolutely a build and customize your own fighter kind of question. And as I understand it, movies and games like Pandemic, Outbreak, Plague Inc. get a lot of things wrong, but obviously can scare the hell out of people. We have seen many destructive outbreaks in our history, including the Black Plague, Spanish Flu, Cholera. However, many of these might have been significantly mitigated with our modern technology and cleanliness. What is scientifically the scariest thing we can expect from a modern virus, assuming, you know, relative competence in our response? So I think that's a very good question. And I'm going to give you an answer that you don't expect. So people usually think that the ultimate virus is a virus that can kill you really quickly. So For example, one of the most lethal viruses is Ebola virus, right? Mm -hmm. Which has a a mortality rate of around 90%. So if you get it, you're pretty pretty sure you're gonna die. In the virology community, we actually call this a dumb virus because Mm -hmm. why would the virus want to destroy its host. As soon as it kills you, then the virus has nowhere to go. It's sort of out of luck. The ultimate viruses, in my opinion, the viruses that are the most successful are those that you don't even know are living with you, you know, that can infect you and stay with you your entire life, you know, like herpes virus. HIV is an ultimate virus because It can live inside your cells for many, many, many years, slowly causing you to die over time. It can be undetectable for for a long time before you see any symptoms. And then like Epstein-Barr virus, for example, can can live in your body and be undetected for for many, many years. Uh, Chickenpox virus can live in your cerebral spinal fluid for many years and then later can come back out. So there are these viruses, I think, that have adapted super well to live with us without killing us. I mean, HIV definitely kills us in the end. Other viruses that can live with us and not kill us, I think those are actually the ultimate viruses and they're the most successful. They really figured out how to make use of us without killing us. And do you think that there is a, a, a more closer middle ground, uh, a potential ultimate virus, as I mentioned before, that still has a decent uh, lethality um, that's able to get to a lot of different people and, and still kill people like we've seen 
in these movies Outbreak and Pandemic and Plague Inc. Do you think this kind of scenario is possible? Or is it that it becomes too lethal, it doesn't spread as much, and if it becomes too spreading, it doesn't yeah. lethal as much? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the general thought, is viruses that are super lethal tend to not spread as quickly because they kill people really quickly, so they don't have a chance to spread. That's why I think Ebola hasn't really taken over the world because it just kills its victims really quickly. You know, the ultimate virus, I think, would have an, a long incubation period so that people mm. could not have any symptoms and still transmit the virus unknowingly to other people, and then a high fatality rate. So if it had a long incubation phase plus a high fatality rate, then uh, that, I think, would be really scary for mankind, right? Because then you 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 um, could transmit it to a lot of people before knowing that people are going to die from it. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate talking about the coronavirus. And to all my audience out there, I know that this is completely left field of the kind of videos that I make. But I saw an opportunity, my brother being part of the cure for coronavirus. And that, that, that really just, that, that's like, yeah, go team. And I really wanted to make a video about it. And maybe this kind of thing, Dichronic Radio, can continue in the future. We'll see exactly how that works. Maybe some gaming news. Let me know in the comments down below. But thank you so much. Hope you guys have a fantastic day. My name's Dichronic, and I'll see you guys on the next one. That was good, right? Um, we are ready to go. Are you ready to go? I have to pee. Should I go pee now? <laughs> Yeah, probably will. Okay, hold on. Getting all pumped up and it's just like, I have to pee. How old are we now? At least he's gone pee, he didn't do it in the middle. How'd it go? Oh, great.